Welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Creating Products from Farm Produce, uh, Best Practices for Food Safety and Regulations for Value-Added Food Production in Vermont. I'm Jesse Schmidt, and I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project. I'm going to be moderating this evening. Our presenter tonight is Londa Nwadike. She's the UVM Extension Food Safety Specialist. Londa grew up on a diversified farm in South Dakota, and after receiving her graduate degrees, worked internationally in food safety for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Londa now works with value-added producers of all sizes in Vermont to improve the safety of their products and to assist them with complying with state and federal regulations. Welcome, Londa. Thank you, Jesse. Um, and I have to say, it's webinars are great because I can. I know Jesse's in the office, but I can be home and, and uh, give my baby a bath a few minutes before, and, and then uh, give the webinar after. So I'm hopefully the rest of you are somewhere comfortable as well listening to this and. Um, and hopefully it's beneficial as well. And I know that a lot of people also um, listen, will listen to the recording as well. I know I had a few people asking about that. So, um, so ask good questions because then um, the people that are going to be listening to the recording get some good feedback. So, um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first question I have, actually, I know um, Eric mentioned that he's from out of state. Um, let me see. So, if you can, if you're from Vermont, can you check uh, check the yes button? If those of you remember how to do that. Okay, I see two. So, if you're from out of state, then you can click the no button, I guess. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, that's good to just have a little bit of a little bit of idea um, because so tonight I'm going to talk. I'm going to start out with talking about uh, food regulations for the state of Vermont. So um, so Eric and, and anybody that's listening to the recording later, um, you know these you'll have to find out from your state, of course, what exactly um, the regulations are. But but. Um, you know, some of the some of the same principles might be true in other states, but they could also, of course, be different. So, um, so I'll talk about our regulations here in Vermont, and then when um, I see Sandy is from Vermont too, so thank you. So I'll talk. Then I'll talk about uh, federal regulations, and that um, applies to everyone, obviously. And then, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about food safety best practices, and. Um, and so, you know, this the webinar is kind of geared for uh, farmers that, you know, you might be used to growing, you know, fresh whole produce and selling fresh whole produce, um, and now you're wanting to get into uh, selling, you know, some sort of value-added products. And so, I'll try to kind of highlight the things that are different um, between fresh whole produce and and value-added. Of course, a lot of things are the same too, but there's some things that'll be different. So. And as Jesse mentioned, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to um, please feel free to write your questions in the chat box, and and I can answer them during, or I can it might might save some of them to the end as well. Um, but but if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and write it down before you forget. So um, so the first thing that I want to start talking talking about, and as Jesse said, I uh, my title is Extension Food Safety Specialist, and I studied public health, and so I'm always interested in um, a little bit about statistics and how many people actually are getting sick um, from foodborne illness. And, and, you know, so you can see the statistics listed there, but the thing is that these statistics are really underreported, um, and the statistics are usually kind of skewed a little bit towards, um, towards large-scale agriculture, outbreaks from large-scale agriculture, because um, of the way that you know reporting happens, uh, you know if you have diarrhea or you're vomiting, um, you know not very many of us actually go to the doctor uh, when that happens. I know I had it a few weekends ago and I didn't go to the doctor. Um, so first you have to go to the doctor, then the doctor has to take a stool sample, and then there has to be enough people that have that same strain of, of microorganism. Um, for them to be able to say, oh, I wonder if this is, you know, if this is all from the same, same source. And um, so there has to be a lot of people that ate that food product 
um, for it to actually show up as being a you know a foodborne disease outbreak. So, um, so all that to say that um, you know people could get sick from from even small scale agriculture, uh, but it just doesn't show up on the radar very often because not as many people are eating food made by you know produced by um, a small local producer. Um, but but also I want to make sure I emphasize that products from small scale producers can be very safe. Um, and products from large scale producers can be not safe or they can be safe. You know, it all depends on your practices. So um, so that's the important thing that I really want to make sure that everybody, you know, understands. And obviously those of you that are listening, obviously you think food board, food safety is important, otherwise you wouldn't be <laughs> spending your hour with us tonight. So um, so I'm preaching to the choir, so to say. Um, in foodborne illness, in you know, if you're a generally a healthy, um, healthy adult, you know, you don't have any major, you know, major health issues. Generally speaking, foodborne illness probably probably isn't as big of a concern for you. But if you're selling to any of these groups that are listed on this slide, um, you know, to young people, you know, children, to the older people, if you're selling to um, nursing homes or maybe a senior center or um, you know, pregnant women. Pregnant women are especially susceptible to listeria, and uh, because listeria can cross the, the placenta and can even cause um, uh, miscarriage. So, you know, of course, pregnant women buy you know most products. Um, and it, you know, if you're selling to hospitals or anywhere where there might be sick people, uh, you know, you really have to be concerned with, um, especially concerned with food uh, food safety, and. Uh, so I, since I've already mentioned my daughter, this is a picture of my daughter about a year ago, actually. So she's quite a bit older and has more hair here. And this is my grandma. And when I and when I think about um, the importance of food safety, I really think about you know these two extremes that I you know that you really want to make sure that um, your product is safe for for those um, you know for those sort of groups. So um, so to start out with. Um, you know, just generally speaking, like if, if I want to start making salsa or I want to start making jams or jellies or, or bread or something, you know, what, what regulations do I need to follow anyway? And um, so the, the first question that I always ask people is, is well, if you're just selling in your state, um, then really it's the state regulations that apply. So you need to follow your state regulations. Once you start selling across state lines, then you need to pay attention to federal um, regulations. Um, and, and when you're selling across state lines, there's no size exemptions. No matter if you're selling $10 worth of products or $1,000 worth of products, you have to meet the federal requirements. Um, I'll be talking about the Food Safety Modernization Act in some upcoming slides, and that um, could really change things in terms of um, you know, if, if people if you're only selling in state, uh, you might have to might have to follow this Food Safety Modernization Act. So um, that that's uh, right now the rules are in the proposed rule stage, and that's from FDA. So I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if you're selling your products to grocery stores or co-ops, distributors, they may have stricter requirements than. Um, than the regulatory requirements, so you need to be sure to check with them. Um, I know a lot of specialty food producers, um, you know, their goal is to sell to something like Whole Foods someday. And I mean that's it's great, you know, it's a great market. It's a you know, it'd be a great place to sell your products. But they do have really strict requirements. They rec they have a lot stricter requirements than the government regulations. So um, and even if you're selling to distributors that are selling to kind of larger um, specialty food stores in larger cities, such as in Vermont, um, I know I have I work with someone that sells to that sells to a distributor that distributes in um, to specialty food stores in Boston, and and she has to have a HACCP plan and some additional food safety plans um, just to be able to sell to them. So just check with your buyer um, to find out what their requirements are. Um, again, in the state of Vermont, and it's, I'm sure it's true in most states, if you're selling to restaurants, um, you have to follow the state regulations. There's no size exemptions. 
um, because the restaurant has to buy products only from an approved source. Um, and so I'll talk in a minute about these exemptions that are in Vermont. But, but if you're selling at restaurants, those exemptions don't apply to you. Um, and then if you're selling to farmers market, selling at farmers markets, um, there's not there's depending on what you're selling. If you're selling prepared foods, there's some additional regulations and some temperatures that you need to be concerned with. I actually did a webinar on this a week or two ago, um, and I have a number of fact sheets as well on on um, rec sorry, regulations and best practices for selling at farmers markets. So um, I, I'll have a link to that website at the end where you can find more information on that. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to start with talking about the, so as I said, I'll start with the state of Vermont. And um, these are the health department regulations. Um, and those of you that just joined, I saw Michelle and Racy One joined. Um, I asked at the beginning, and if you don't mind, um, if you're from the state of Vermont, there's a, um, above your name, there's a checkbox, and there's a, a green check for yes and a red check for no. If you don't mind, if you're from the state of Vermont, uh, those of you that just joined, if you could um, click yes if you're from Vermont and click the red no if you're not from Vermont, just, just so I have an idea of who we're, who we're talking to. So Racy's not from Vermont. And that's fine. Just just wanted to just wanted to check. Maybe Michelle's still finding it. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, so so back to the Vermont regulations. And again, in your you'll have to check in your state exactly what. Okay, Michelle is from Vermont. Thank you. Um, so uh, you'll have to check in your state what the regulations are. But in Vermont, uh, you need to have something called a food processor's license if you're doing. Um, you know, jams, jellies, salsa, uh, what else, candy, those sort of things, those all fall under the food processor's license. However, there is an exemption that um, if you're selling less, okay, Racy's from New York, thank you. Um, if you're selling less than $10,000 worth of product per year, you don't need to have um, a food processor's license. So, um, so you don't, you're, you're not regulated if you're selling less than $10,000 per year in the state of Vermont. And I know that New York um, is stricter than that, and I'm guessing Virginia is as well. So, um, so Vermont has a little bit more lenient in that regard. Um, and just to mention as well, if you're selling um, acidified foods, which would be um, salsas, and um, if you're selling um, pickles, um, anything that, that's kind of a vegetable that's had some vinegar added to it, um, and you're selling it shelf stable, those are um, considered acidified foods, and you have to have what's called a scheduled process for that. Um, so if you have questions on a scheduled process, I can, I can provide you with more information on that. Um, so if you're selling baked goods, like you know, breads, cakes, etc., then you need a bakery license. Again, there's an exemption. Um, on, so you need that license if you're selling more than $6,500 per year. Um, so if you're just doing a few farmers markets and selling, you know, $200 worth, well, hopefully a little more than that, $300, $400 worth of baked goods, um, you don't need a license in Vermont. Um, if you're selling juice, um, then you need to have uh, a food processor's license, again, if you're selling more than $10,000. So if you're under that, you don't need a, a food processor's license for juice. Um, if you're selling juice out of state, you are required to have a HACCP plan, which is a Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points plan. Um, if you're selling in, in the state of Vermont, they just request that you have a HACCP plan. It's not really a legal requirement. Um, if you're, and again, HACCP plans, I can provide more information on that if you're interested. Uh, if you're selling seafood, um, then there's no size exemption, no matter how much you're selling, any sort of, um, you know, catching of seafood and processing it or, or just selling it, uh, you have to have um, a HACCP plan and you have to follow the regulations. Okay, so um, all those regulations that I just talked about there, um, as well as the restaurant inspection and then catering licenses, those are all under the Vermont, Vermont Department of Health. Um, then switching over to the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, 
they regulate um, any dairy products, maple, um, especially maple syrup, not so much other maple products. That's really under the um, Department of Health. Um, ag also regulates pet food. Um, so now for all those products, um, there's no size exemption. So if you're selling $20 worth of cheese, you have to have um, a dairy, um, dairy inspection license. And they have uh, very specific regulations, and, and uh, dairy in particular, it's, it's uh, pretty stringent. Um, you, you know, you can do it, um, you know, it is possible to be able to, um, you know, to be able to build a facility on your farm, but, but you know, you, they, you have to have stainless steel, et cetera. Um, so the Agency of Ag also regulates meat, and um, with meat, uh, if you if you're selling a product that has more than three percent meat or poultry by raw weight, that will fall under the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. So if you wanted to make something like a, a meat pie, um, you know, or a chicken pot pie, or um, you know something like that, and you wanted to sell it, um, you know, frozen or refrigerated or something uh, at a grocery store, that would fall under the Agency of Agriculture regulations. And meat is quite strict in their regulations. Um, you have to have a HACCP plan. It has to be quite detailed. Again, that's the Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points plan. Um, and you have to have, you have daily inspection and you have, again, stainless steel and so on. Um, so I know that some people, um, you know, they feel like, well, they could just, you know, do a little value added of their own. but. Um, it has to be done at an inspected facility. Again, you can, you know, get the facility on your farm inspected, but it has to meet the requirements. Um, so, uh, so if you're selling, and I think probably many of you know about the poultry exemption, if you're doing less than a thousand birds um, per year on your farm, you can do it without inspection. Um, and again, I have some fact sheets that talk more specifically about the meat regulations. Um, to get more information. And also, if you're a producer and you're selling meats, um, you know, depending on where you're selling, you have to have different licenses um, to sell. All right, the Agency of Agriculture is also uh, responsible for all labeling in the state of Vermont. So um, even though, like your jams and jellies and so on, they might be, um, the, the safety of them might be inspected by health, the labeling of them is inspected by agriculture. Um, in the state. And I see your um, Racy's question here, so I'll, I'll address it while I, while it's fresh in my head. Do you know how similar these rules and, and roles of the different departments are for New York? Um, and unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure. I do know that, you, that New York's rules are stricter than Vermont's. I don't think you have any exemptions. I think um, my understanding is that um, you know, if you're selling any amount of food products, you have to, it has to be inspected. There's not those dollar exemptions. Um, one difference, too, is the state of New York does not have a state meat inspection program like Vermont does. Um, so all of your meat inspection would be under, it would be a USDA inspector, um, which the, the requirements really are the same. But the thing is, your inspector is a USDA inspector rather than um, in the case of Vermont, friendly Vermont guys <laughs> that are that are inspecting your your meat product. So, um, and Jesse just put a link that has uh, all those fact sheets I was referring to. Um, so yeah, and and uh, I don't know exactly the breakdown between health and ag in New York. I'm afraid, but um, but I can find out. Uh, if, uh, my email will be at the end, Racy, and if you want to send me an email. Um, to remind me to look, I can I can look for you. I can find out. Okay, so um, in the state of Vermont, uh, again, if you're wanting to apply for um, these different state licenses that I talked about, um, rather than giving you all the links um, in this webinar, I just decided to to refer you to this fact sheet. Um, that I that I have on um, on food safety requirements for Vermont food processors, and um, in that fact sheet, there's you know specific information on exactly what's needed, uh, depending on what you're selling, and then there's information on how to get the licenses from the health department and um, 
from the Agency of Agriculture. Um, so the links that Jesse put up earlier, that um, you can click on that. Or this is a shorter, a <laughs> little bit prettier URL listed here, and then you just click on uh, food safety for producers and processors, and then it's under publications. Um, and then you can find this fact sheet and the other fact sheets that I've been referring to. Okay, so now I'm going to go jump to the federal level, and so this would apply to um, to everybody in, in all states um, across the U.S. So, um, so as I kind of indicated before, um, USDA inspection, uh, USDA would inspect meat and poultry products. Um, so again, it's the same requirement as for Vermont, um, the 3% meat or poultry by raw weight, anything greater than that is under USDA inspection. Um, you're required to have a HACCP plan, um, and again, there's no size exemptions. And, and just to mention, too, that the Vermont meat inspection, it's, it's considered equal to USDA inspection, but like I said, the big difference is, um, in my mind, the state inspection, the, the inspectors are, you know, are a little bit more, have a little bit more of an education focus rather than just a regulatory focus where the USDA inspectors are really have a more of a regulatory focus. So, um, and I'll get to Michelle's question after I finish. Uh, I'll talk about the nutrition facts and I'll get to your question. Um, so for meat, um, there's a, well, rel I guess it's a year old now, but um, a, regula or a requirement now for nutrition facts labeling on, um, on meat products, uh, whole muscle cuts and, and products with more than two ingredients. So, um, and again, I have more information about that in the label, meat labeling um, fact sheet if you're interested. Um, so if you're planning to use the Hardwick Food Hub, hub sorry, would you need a license of, of your own? Um, the Hardwick Food Hub, and I don't know what kind of product you're interested in, um, they do not, you cannot do meat there, um, but you can do all the other products that I've talked about. Well, they don't, they, well, can't really do cheese there either necessarily, but, but you can do, you know, salsa and all those sort of things. You still have to get um, a food process. If you're doing, you know, like uh, jams or jellies or sauces, salsa, etc., you still have to have your own food processor's license um, because the processor's license is tied to you, not the facility. Um, however, it's very easy to get the license um, if you're using a facility like the one in Hardwick because um, they're already, you know, the, the facility has already passed inspection and, and they know, you know, they know the facility, the inspector knows the facility very well. Um, they also have FDA inspectors come through, so, you know, even if you're doing FDA, um, that would be fine. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, especially if you're doing the in-state license, you still need to have your own license. Um, okay, great. Yep, sauce, barbecue sauce, and ketchup. Yep, exactly. So those sort of products would all be um, would all be under the food processor's license. And and again, you know, it's really just almost a matter of just sending in your money, and and it's like hundred and something dollars per year um, for the license. And those products probably would not require a scheduled process depending on what kind of sauce you're doing, but the barbecue sauce and ketchup would not require a scheduled process. Okay, so FDA regulations. Um, again, like I mentioned before, there's no size exemption. So if you're selling, you know, $10 worth of products across state lines, you have to have, um, you, have to have you have to be registered with the FDA, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you, and you have to follow the FDA requirements. Um, so FDA really, they do, um, you know, processed foods and baked goods, like like I talked about earlier with the Department of Health in Vermont. Um, FDA also does dairy products, maple syrup, pet food. Those are all things that are regulated by the Agency of Agriculture here in Vermont. But in um, in uh, at FDA, they're regulated by the sorry at the federal level, they're regulated by FDA. Um, I don't know if anybody from New Hampshire is on, but I know that in New Hampshire, um, dairy products are regulated by the state health department there. Um, and I'm not sure about New York off the top of my head. 
Um, FDA also regulates seafood and fruit juice, and again, they require you to have a HACCP plan. All right, so, um, so as I mentioned, if you're selling products out of state, then you have to, um, you have to be registered with the FDA. And um, so the steps for that are, first you have to get your licensing from the state of, from the uh, appropriate Vermont agency. So even if you're selling less than $10,000 worth of products in the state of Vermont and you're exempt from the state requirements, um, if you're selling out of state, then you still have to um, get the proper licensing from the state of Vermont because that's the requirement for FDA to have the proper state licensing first. Um, so with FDA, well, with State of Vermont, I, I kind of alluded to it. It's uh, you know you have to pay a, a register or a licensing fee of like $115 or something. You have to you know send in your money yearly. Uh, with FDA, it's free. Uh, at, at this point, they're talking about having user fees, but at this point, it's free. Um, you would just register online. Um, I didn't share the link right now, but I have it in that uh, fact sheet, the food regulations fact sheet that I mentioned earlier. Um, you, you're, you're required to re-register your facility every two years. Um, it's in the fall of the even numbered years, so 2014 in the fall. Um, you should re-register. They just want to keep track of everyone, keep their list current. Um, the FDA might come and inspect your facility once you register with them. Um, on average, I've heard, a, a, on national average, FDA inspects your facility once every approximately seven years because uh, there's so many food processing facilities across the U.S. that the FDA is um, meant to inspect. They just can't get to everybody. If you're considered a higher risk um, facility, like if you're doing cheese or something, they'll come a lot more often than um, once every seven years. But, uh, you know, no guarantees how often they'll come. Uh, so the FDA requirements are um, you have to meet what's called the good manufacturing practices, and um, I'll talk. That's what I'm going to be talking about in the next section. Are, are basically good manufacturing practices, kind of best practices, um, and you can find um, those good manufacturing practices there available in um, the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, Part 110, and um, I found FDA's URLs are really, usually really long, so usually the best way to find them um, rather than me giving you a long URL is to just, just Google that and, and you'll be able to find them. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's, um, so as I mentioned earlier, FDA has some proposed rules on um, what's called the Food Safety Modernization Act. and um, there's a proposed rule on produce safety as well as a proposed rule on um, what's called preventative controls. And preventative controls is basically for food processors. Um, these proposed rules, they're still in the comment period. Um, it looks like the comment period is going to be extended until like September, which is good to give us more time to look through them and, and make some comments. Um, and it'll be a few years before um, processors would need to implement them. Um, however, as I'll talk about the next slide, it's a good idea to start thinking about it now and to start moving towards um, moving towards it, whether you're going to be exempted or not, because um, we don't know what the final rules are going to say in any case. So, um, and, and you know, anyway, I have it the next slide, so I'll save it till the next slide. Um, oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention too, uh, while I'm while I'm talking about it. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, I wanted to kind of highlight the differences a little bit, the differences between produce safety and, and uh, processing safety. With produce, um, if currently, if you're selling produce uh, in the state of Vermont, there's absolutely no regulations um, for you know the safety of produce that you're selling. If you're, so, if you're selling, you know, your fresh uh, tomatoes and carrots and whatever at the farmers market, fresh whole you know, tomatoes and carrots and peppers and all those things, um, the only regulatory requirement is that the product has not been exposed to floodwaters. So, um, so you know, for produce growers, these proposed um, FDA rules are, are a big game changer because, you know, they haven't had regulations before. Uh, people doing value-added products, you know, they're more used to regulations and, and um, 
you know, people are kind of aware that they need to operate under regulations. But um, so anyway, that's a big difference between, you know, if you're just selling fresh whole produce versus selling um, value added products, then there's a lot more regulatory control. So, um, so on the preventative controls proposed rules um, for um, FDA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, you can see there's a number of exemptions. And I apologize that it's small font, um, but it's just to kind of to show that there's a lot of exemptions, but they're a little bit confusing. Um, and so, I, again, I have a fact sheet that, that lists these in more detail. Um, and again, everyone, different people kind of interpret these proposed rules a little bit differently. And, and the thing is, we don't know exactly what's going to come out in the final rules anyway. But, um, but at this point, it looks like small processors would be exempt um, from following the FDA um, revised requirements. But, um, but you'd still have to follow the state regulations. Um, one thing that's Kind of interesting is food hubs and, and people that are that are commingling produce from multiple uh, multiple growers. They would they would fall under the preventative controls requirements if they're if they're um, storing if they're having warehousing of the products. You can see that one's listed at the bottom there. Um, so that's something important for food hubs um, and anybody doing kind of um, you know commingling of products from different farms um, to keep in mind. So if you are going to be covered by um, the preventative controls rules, if you're not um, exempt from them, <clears throat> what would you need? Um, you would need to have a, a written food safety plan, which is similar to a HACCP plan. Um, I talked, I've talked about HACCP a little bit. It's hazard analysis and critical control points. Um, so this preventative controls plan, um, would require you to do monitoring and have records and corrective actions um, for, uh, okay, yeah, okay, so this preventative controls would um, require you to, to um, monitor and have records and then corrective action plans for your food allergen controls, <coughs> also for your sanitation of your, of your plant or of your facility and then uh, rec your recall plans. Um, in HACCP plans, you have to go through and, and identify where the biggest hazards are and where your most critical control points are in your process. Usually those are like in a cooking step or a chilling step. Um, and then you have to keep track, you have to do monitoring, you know, of, of the temperature, of the time, um, you know, and keep records of that. So, so that's in a typical HACCP plan. But this preventative controls plan, um, you would have to have that, as well as doing monitoring and record keeping and so on for, um, for items that are typically, and HACCP plans are considered prerequisite programs. So those, um, those uh, food allergen controls and sanitation and so on. So, um, so preventative controls are kind of, it's, uh, it's the language that FDA used, used in the Food Safety Modernization Act to talk about, um, you know, the, the places where you can um, best prevent uh, foodborne, foodborne illness from uh, potentially resulting from your process. Um, so it's, uh, so preventative controls could be cooking, could be chilling. Uh, it could also be, you know, sanitation plans, that sort of thing. Um, so the other thing with the um, preventative controls rule is is that um, they're updating the good manufacturing practices, and I talked about the, those earlier, and we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, the language will be updated a little bit too, but um, but it's not a major update really. But so those good manufacturing practices, and again, that's what we'll talk about next, are really important. Um, whether you're covered by the new requirements or not. So, and again, if you're not going to be covered, you know, if you are going to be exempt from, if you're a small enough producer, if you're if you're selling lower risk products and you'd be exempt, you know, why why is this important? Why do I keep talking about it? Well, um, here in Vermont, the state is um, talking about updating its regulations. <laughs> right now, as I mentioned, the state of Vermont 
food processing regulations are, are relatively um, loose compared to other states. Um, so, uh, so they really want to, so they're talking about updating those to have, um, to have them be stricter to kind of match uh, the FDA's requirements. And, you know, whenever there's a new regulation that comes into place, um, buyers very often um, also increase their requirements. So, um, so the bar is kind of raised um, for everybody, and then buyers might also require, have stricter requirements. So, so it's something, again, to keep your eye on. Um, okay, so if you're exempt at the federal level, how does that differ from the state GMP? Um, so if you are exempt um, from the Federal Food Safety Modernization, Re Food Safety Modernization Act requirements, um, then basically you just have to follow the state, um, your state food safety regulations. Um, and then in addition, uh, you have to make sure that the name of the facility where you processed um, the product is on the label, which, which is already really essentially a requirement of labeling. And then you're supposed to notify the FDA, um, you know, that you're, that you're operating under that small business exemption. Um, but again, we don't know exactly how the final rules are going are gonna to shake out. So that's, that's, what we, that's what our interpretation, my interpretation is of the proposed rules at this point. Um, does that answer your question, Tony? Or if if uh, if you're looking for something else, just just uh, maybe you can ask another question to and I can clarify. Okay, I'll um I'll keep going here, and, and uh, Tony, if you have another question, feel free to let me know. So some other steps to starting, and again. Um, <coughs> They, these might be a little bit different in your state, but generally speaking, these, these are the steps, I'm sure, in every state, but this for sure in Vermont, um, you need to do these things. Um, so you need to make sure that you check with your town or, or your city clerk for any uh, local zoning restrictions and any licensing permitting that they might have, so just to make sure that you're following um, their requirements. Um, it's important to get a state food processor's license here in the state of Vermont they require that you first talk to the Department of sorry the Department of Environmental Conservation um, to check on the wastewater facility or the wastewater plan. Um, they don't necessarily require that you have a new you don't have to necessarily put in a new septic system. They might say you know your sep your current septic system is fine, um, but you do have to check with the Department of Environmental Conservation. So that's um, that's something that's important. Um, they do also require that you check with the Department of Public Safety to make sure that you're following um, the electrical and fire and plumbing codes. Um, so in order to get your state food processor's license, you have to be in compliance with the DEC and the Department of Public Safety. Um, you also need to check with the tax division, unfortunately. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, but uh, you have to check with the tax division to make sure that you're doing your tax requirements properly. And then you, know, you probably want to um, protect the name of your business, so you might want to register with the Secretary of State to, to protect your, your awesome name that you have for your business. And this link down here um, has, more, has the links to all these um, different websites. That's the um, Department of Health, Food and Lodging Program uh, website down there. All right, so I've been talking about these best practices, and, and um, so now I'm going to kind of I'm going to finish up with this. Um, so again, these best practices are, I mean, generally speaking, this is what the um, state of Vermont's um, uh, food safety requirements are for food processors, um, and also um, I guess I have it listed down here. Um, also, this is generally speaking, the FDA's requirements. Um, so I'm going to talk about these best practices kind of in general terms, but um, again, if you look up, you know, the FDA's uh, good manufacturing practices, you can get the more specific details. Um, and the state of Vermont, too, you can find the specific regulations that are required. Um, so these good manufacturing practices, that's, that's the terminology that FDA uses. Um, 
in, in the regulations. And they're just, they're the basic sanitary and processing requirements um, that are needed to just make sure that you're processing safe food. So um, they're, to me, they're just, they're just best practices. You know, they're a good idea for everyone to follow whether you're exempted or not, whether you're required to meet regulations or not. Um, you know, and this is, yeah, like it says here, this is what's needed to, to meet the current and the future um, state and federal regulations. Um, and this is both for USDA and FDA. Um, so if you're doing anything under, if you're doing the meat processing, um, USDA also requires that you follow good manufacturing practices. So um, again, I've been mentioning HACCP plans. Uh, if you are required to have a HACCP plan, that HACCP plan requires that you have these good manufacturing practices in place. So, so they're really important. Again, I have a fact sheet um, that kind of, you know, gives a nice or gives a two-page overview of good manufacturing practices that might be helpful um, for you. Okay, so to start out with, um, and 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 I just want to emphasize too that a lot of these things are probably common sense. And and again, if you're kind of going from being a you know a produce grower or some sort of a um, producer on the farm to doing food processing, uh, value-added processing. A lot of these things are kind of common sense, but um, and some of these things might be things you're already doing, but but some might be a little bit different. There might be some new things to think about w with food processing. So um, so again, I'll just talk about them. So uh, for buildings and facilities, when you're doing food processing um, or value-added processing, you just want to make sure that the grounds are free of weeds, you have good drainage. You know, the facilities, you have to have cleanable surfaces, um, good ventilation and lighting. Um, you know, the FDA, th these regulations, they don't really specify, you know, the specific surfaces that you need to have, just that they need to be cleanable. Um, so that kind of makes it more general. Um, again, hand washing facilities, uh, need good water, just kind of all basic things, I guess. Your equipment and utensils, you have to make sure that you're using, um, that, they're, that they're of a sanitary design. Uh, again, cleanable materials is important. Uh, you know, make sure that it's food grade um, materials, food grade equipment that you're using. Um, and, and then just that the equipment is, you know, installed and maintained that you can easily clean underneath and behind. Um, this isn't a great picture, but you can see that these carts are on wheels here. Um, and so, uh, you know, they can be moved easily. I guess these are shelves, really. Um, so then you can clean underneath the shelf and below the, or behind the shelf more easily than if it was um, tied to the ground. Um, personnel, again, this is, this is the same as <laughs> if you're doing produce, um, raising fresh produce on your farm. Um, you know, you have to make sure that no one is working sick. Uh, you know, think about all the germs that are spread uh, if you're sneezing. Um, and just, you know, everybody has to use good hygienic practices. If you're doing value-added production, you need to wear hair restraints. Um, you know, no eating in production. Again, these are kind of common sense things. Okay, that one area that's kind of, again, kind of different from just uh, straight production to, to value-added processing, uh, that you really need to think about your raw material and your, your raw materials coming in and your suppliers that you're using. Um, you need to have some sort of a system in place to make sure that your, the raw materials that are coming in um, and the suppliers that you're using that, you know, that, that those materials are safe. Because your product is only as good as the ingredients that go into that, and um, and you know, of course, even if you're buying produce from your own farm or using produce from your own farm, I should say, you know, you want to make sure that that's the best quality, safest um, material that it that it that it can be. Um, so you know, especially if you're getting in um, ingredients from from other places. Or your own farm, of course, you want to have some sort of inspection procedure, you know, for incoming loads, making sure that everything is, you know, meeting the, your requirements and, and, um, and that you're also just having good, you know, good handling and good storage once um, those ingredients get into your, uh, your facility where you're doing your processing. Okay, so then um, when you're actually processing, um, you know, you make sure that you're, 
whatever ingredients are coming in first, that you're using those first. Uh, again, it's kind of common sense. Um, and then another important point here is that I have is date and log incoming products. I think I have a slide later where I talk about traceability and recall. A lot tracking, that's something that's um, going to be even more important under these new, um, new Food Safety Modernization Act requirements. Um, so that's, so it's really important when you do get in ingredients that you're dating, dating those ingredients and keeping track of uh, what ingredients are coming in. Um, and you know, just making sure that you're storing your materials in a safe manner. Um, you know, making sure that that everything is has good temperature control. Those are all important. Okay, um, sanitation is super important, as everybody I'm sure is is uh, is well understood. Um, you you want to make sure that you're sanitizing everything properly. You're washing everything, and um, you know, to again, once you get up to the higher levels of food safety programs and, and the stricter inspections, um, you have to have everything documented uh, of what you're doing for cleaning. Um, you know, if you're just using, if you're just operating under a, uh, you know, just the state of Vermont uh, food processors license, they don't require you to document your your um, sanitation standard operating procedures, but Again, once you start getting to the higher levels, you need to have that documented. It's just a matter of writing down, you know, step one, take apart the mixer, step two, spray it off, step three, you know, wash it with a brush, that sort of thing. Um, but it's also a good way, you know, if you have a new employee, you can, you can show them like, okay, here's our SOPs, our standard operating procedures for washing, and then that's an easy way to train people. Um, another point I wanted to make is that it's important to um, have, make sure that you're doing, um, make sure they have a schedule to kind of make sure that you're cleaning the coolers, cleaning the hallways, these areas that you don't have to clean every day, but you do need to make sure you clean them periodically, you know, weekly, monthly, whatever is appropriate for your facility. Okay, um, allergen control, this is something that's really important. Um, again, under the Food Safety Modernization Act, but also um, it's really important for, um, because so many people are sensitive to allergies these days. Um, people are really aware of allergens, um, and you really want to make sure that you're um, paying attention to this, because you're, a lot of your customers are. Um, so you can see the eight major allergens that are listed. These are the ones that um, you're required by law to um, List on your label, and also to um, and also to monitor in your facility. So here's the main points for allergen control. Um, you know, make sure that your raw materials are properly labeled and stored. Make sure you know where your allergen container ingredients are in your facility. Um, so just you know, again, kind of some common sense things, but but just it's really important to keep to be aware of allergens. Okay, pest control. Um, this is another another thing. Again, that's probably this is similar again to um, you know if you're growing produce or if you have animals. Obviously, you don't want pests everywhere um, because you know they're not good for production and they're not good for processing either. Um, so you really want to just make sure you prevent um, any of those pests from getting into your facility. Um, but then, you know, if you can't get them, if, if they do get in, you want to make sure they don't have anything to eat while they're there. Um, and then if you have to exterminate them, that's the last resort. Okay, chemical control. It's also very important to make sure that um, any cleaners, sanitizers, lubricants, all those things um, that are in your facility that are not, I mean, they're not actually ingredients, um, you want to make sure that they are properly labeled that they're stored, you know, away from the food, and that you're using them at the right amount. Um, you know, if you if you think a cup of sanitizer is is good, well, two cups is better. That's unfortunately not true. <laughs> if a cup is what's required, you use a cup. That's it. Okay. Uh, another program that you have to think about is glass control. Um, you know. If you're sometimes, you know, if you're using glass um, glass jars, you know, for for your packaging, then it's pretty obvious. Like, oh, I got to make sure I I don't have breakage of glass. 
but also, you know, um, everybody has light bulbs. Almost everybody, I think, has light bulbs in their facility. Um, so you want to make sure that those light bulbs are covered, um, and you want to make sure that uh, you know that that you know where all the glass is in your facility, um, and then you, so you can prevent any breakage from occurring. And even if you can't prevent the breakage from occurring, at least you can detect it. Like you know where to look for glass breakage. I mean, nobody wants to have a piece of glass end up in their beautiful sauce that they're selling to people. Okay, so um, I think this is the last category of these sort of things. I'll talk about foreign materials. Um, again, you know, nobody wants to see a nut or a bolt or, you know, a person knife <laughs> or, you know, a piece of wood or a chunk of plastic. You know, we don't want to see those in our food products and, and um, so, you, so there's a lot of potential sources. You can see them all listed here. Um, how these foreign materials can get into your food product. So in order to control them, um, you want to make sure that you're doing good visual inspection um, when you're receiving the products, or receiving the raw materials, sorry, that you don't have, you know, chunks of wood in your carrots or something like that, or big rocks or something. Um, and you know, when you're adding ingredients to the mixer, make sure that you're watching that there's no you know, chunks of stray things coming in. Um, and just practicing, you know, good hygiene and good housekeeping, those are all important things. But just things to keep in mind. And, and like even having a pen in your coat pocket, your, uh, if it's a lab coat, uh, if you lean over, that pen could fall in and you don't want a pen ending up in your products. Okay, I mentioned earlier traceability and recall. Um, again, this is something that's a, really of growing importance. Um, and it, so it's important that you know, you need to know where your ingredients came from. You need to know who you bought them from. You need to know which ingredients went into every batch of your product. Um, and then you need to know where your products are going. Because, um, you know, we hope that everybody is producing a safe product, that you, you never have to issue a recall. But if you do, you need to know where your products are going. And what could also happen too, and maybe more, more likely, is that one of the ingredients that you use, like maybe your salt or maybe your, um, you know, whatever it is, um, your starter culture, maybe that's recalled. And then you have to know um, what batches that salt or that starter culture um, went into um, so that you can recall that final product if you need to. So um, you need to have um, an accurate documentation of um, your receiving of your ingredients, of your lot coding system. Um, you, know, you have to know, you have to document your distribution, where your products are going. Um, and I can, I can provide you with some examples of uh, this receiving um, log if you're interested. Um, and here's the Here's the um, distribution record um, example. And uh, Jesse, your question is an excellent question. Um, you asked about if there's any good software programs that help with lot tracking. Are they affordable? Actually, um, thank you for prompting that because the Vermont Farm Viability Program is actually sponsoring a project right now on um, lot tracking. And they did a survey on lot tracking to find out what people are using. And, and they're looking into, and, and the guy's name is Stan Ward that's organizing it. Um, and he's also looking into all the different um, like software programs that are available. There's a number of them available. He just told me today, I think that, that um, he found like 27 different programs or something. Um, unfortunately, all those, well, um, some of them are, are definitely more affordable than others <laughs> um, for those lot tracking software. Um, and so one of the outcomes of that project is intended to, um, intended to make sure that there's, you know, hopefully a, a provision of, of an of a affordable and easy to use and you know, appropriate to scale um, lot tracking system. Um, so yeah, great question. And yeah, you can buy really expensive programs too. Um, okay, 
Tony, um, a link. Uh, is, is that a link for the those records that I was talking about, the distribution and receiving records? Um, I can send I can send a link uh, for those if you're interested. <coughs> Okay, um, so the other um, prerequisite programs, um, I'm wrapping up here, uh, you know, we hope that nobody will have any complaints um, because the, uh, you know, of course your products are going to be great, um, but it's, if there is a, um, if, you, if you do ever get complaints, you really need to log them and track them. Um, that way you can find out, you know, if you need to make any um, corrections to your system. Um, labeling is also really important. I, uh, I mentioned labeling a little bit in the presentation. I do have a fact sheet again on labeling, um, and I do workshops and so on on labeling as well. Um, so that's important too. And then um, the food defense and security prevention of in intentional contamination, that's also something that's kind of of growing importance. Um, and, and so yeah, I'll, I'll uh, go through the slides and I'll address um, Tony's question there. Um, so this additional information, um, so you can see I have a number, so there's some upcoming trainings and then these fact sheets that I've been talking about um, and then a number of links to different places um, are available. Here from this URL that's listed, um, Jesse's also listed it in the um, chat box a few times. Um, and then I just want to mention Vermont has a food safety task force that um, we're trying to get more food safety information from all different aspects of Vermont in one place. Um, there's my contact details. Uh, so uh, if you have any specific questions or any information that you want me to be sure to provide you, um, you can send me an email or give me a call. Um, and Tony, a link for the software for the tracking. Um, at this point, um, like I said, there's like 27 different <laughs> software uh, systems. So I and I don't have I don't have all those links um, readily available. Um, but I can send you again if you send me an email. I can send you at least. Um, this the report of this lot tracking project that's going on, and um, and hopefully the final pro the final results of the project will be out soon, and, and then we'll have um, then we'll have that information more readily available. And I can give you the guy's name who's doing that project too, and he can probably give you all those links pretty easily. So with that, I'm sorry I see it's two minutes to eight, but I'm happy to take any questions um, in the remaining time that we have. Londa, thank you so much. You covered such a wealth of information here in a short period of time, and it's nice to have this all in one place now. So this um, recording uh, is going to be available on the New Farmer Project website as, as well as a PDF of this presentation, so you can go back and reference it um, later. That should take about, usually takes about a week to get up on our website. Um, and if there are any final questions, go ahead and type them in. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, Londa, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us. Looks like there's one question. Um, yeah, and are you, do you have any colleagues in New York, uh, Londa, that are working on this uh, in a similar type way? Yeah. Yeah, Cornell, actually, I go to, um, I call Cornell quite a bit for, for questions there. Cornell is great, especially on um, scheduled process um, stuff. Like, so if you're doing canned foods, um, they're, they're great on that sort of thing. Um, it's the Cornell Food Venture Center. Um, Elizabeth Sullivan is the person I always ask questions to. Um, they don't do quite as much in maybe like farmer's market food safety, that sort of thing, but, but yeah, they have a lot of great expertise there. All right, great. Well, I hope that um, you all take a minute to give us some feedback. And Londa, have a good evening. Thanks again. And we will be having our next webinar uh, the last Tuesday in May, uh, 7 PM. And it's going to be focused on fencing. So please join us for that um, if you are interested. Have a good night, everybody.